Okay, so we're going to have a couple of guests with us here that will show up in a second. And there's Johnny and Joanna. All right, so today we have a great guest. Uh, Joanna's joining us, and I think you're going to be really wild by this today. So I, I will let Johnny give her the basic introduction, and then I will follow up because I know some fun facts behind the scenes. And he's, uh, so Johnny, so uh, uh, have you... Have you met her in person before? Uh, can you tell us uh, how this whole all got started? It is my pleasure to introduce as our guest this week, the lovely and talented Miss Joanna Perrin. Um, I've known Joanna for goodness a long time, and we've been dating a longer time and married a long time. Um, we started, I think we started seeing each other, oh, she doesn't like me to tell you, but it's been a long time. We dated yeah. for forever. And uh, I asked her to marry me every single day of our relationship until she finally um, gave in out of, I think she, she was just sick to death, of, new creative ways to say no. And, and, so, and so we finally got married um, after we'd been together forever. So and we intend to stay together forever. She's wonderfully talented, uh, I think. Um, Joanna, I'll say it while she's here because no one can stop me. Um, she's one of those people who's fantastically talented in a number of ways but simply doesn't have a doesn't seem to understand it her self-image it's not if 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 you don were as talented as joanna if johnny was as talented as joanna with our personalities right we'd be we couldn't you couldn't live you can barely live with us now right but then 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 if but if we had if joanna had just some of our uh self-awareness <laughs> she'd be impossible to live with so i guess it's a good thing but she's really she's a wonderful coach um and gets she, she's she's one of the people who i go to for coaching not only because of her uh availability to me but because she's really insightful um in in seconds I mere seconds cheap. i work cheaply yeah <laughs> it take me to dinner yeah so and so you go ahead and tell some things about her too and then we'll ask her some stuff yeah, well, see, this is what I find fascinating. So the first thing, I got to say the elephant in the room. So everybody first thinks, oh, uh, like, my, like my wife, all her success is attributed to marrying me. No. Mm. She, on her own, is, is far better. She makes me better. So then, in, in Joanna's case, you have this fascinating thing. One, I think she was a street, street performer doing magic tricks before ever doing uh, any of this. Is that? But no. She... <laughs> So here's what happens. This is a bizarre thing, and very few people have a perspective that Joanna has, and here's why. Number one, she is married to one of the, one, uh, somebody who is uh, out there and been out there for over a decade and doing this. So she gets to watch what he does, and, and they get to interact. And, and, but she was a great actor before ever doing any narration. But then there's this other factor that very few people have. Because Johnny does all these conferences all over the world, there are a bunch of them where Joanna is co-coaching, and at the same time, uh, Johnny's built a, a network of some of the best coaches in the world, and he brings them together, and they'll do a little workshop in New York. Well, Joanna gets to go and be a fly on the wall with not only Johnny, who's amazing as a coach, and he, she also gets to observe a, a Sean Pratt, a, a Paul Allen, and a hundred other great narrators and see different points of view and watch them work and watch them coach other people. And one of the things she's super smart about is she takes the best, she steals from a bunch of other people. I'll just say it up front. Where <laughs> instead of, I mean, I go to a few conferences a year. Most of us go to one to four conferences a year. She'll go to more and see more world-class coaches in a year than most of us have seen in a lifetime. And what that allows her to do is to pick and choose. And she already had a great act. So, Joanna, tell us, I mean, it's crazy how much she's seen. It's crazy how much she gets to sponge. And what does that mean? When she coaches somebody else, she's drawing from a pool of world-class actors and coaches and narrators who have been in the business. And, and if you add it all together, She's got hundreds of years of influence coming in all the time from all these people that have a decade or more in the business. And that's a, I wish I had that kind of perspective. So Joanna, when you started off before you did this, tell us a little bit about your acting background and, and what you did before you got into narrating. Cause I think this people think, oh, she fell off a tree and started <laughs> in this business because Johnny sent her some work. What did you do before you, yeah. before um, you- Joy, get closer this? to the mic too. Cause some folks, to yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, I started out as in theater. Uh, I have a theater degree, and uh, so yeah, I, like everybody else has a theater degree. I started in theater in college, and I kind of did everything. I was an actor. I was a stage manager. I built sets. I critiqued. Um, I actually worked uh, during my last year of college um, for a downtown magazine that no longer exists, and I reviewed theater. So I've kind of been immersed in. Can you hear me? Uh, let's see if I can fix her mic a little bit. Hang on. Okay. Can I be heard? Can I not be heard? Um, but anyway, so I was mostly a theater actor, and then I kind of stumbled my way into television. Is that better? Hopefully. Better, better? Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Um, with soaps. So I really started my TV work in soaps, and then I did some extra work, and from there I went to film, and God, I don't know. I think I've been... No. <laughs> I've ended, no better? It's no better? Can you hear me? Yep, they're hearing you better. That's good. <laughs> oh, okay. I, mean, um, I think I've ended up on the floor, I was going to say, of more screening rooms than anything else because I was in a lot of films where um, things got rewritten and my character got written out or uh, once it actually I got more work out of it. Uh, but at the point is I've been around and uh, most of it is theater work. And then I, I got into uh, voiceover indirectly years ago because a friend of mine told his agent they thought they had that I had an interesting voice for voiceover um, but through that I started working on children's stuff so I worked for a company that produced scripts and we used to write I was uh, I became the part-time head writer for children's uh, uh, material on and they used it on HBO and Nickelodeon and stuff like that because of that we had a small budget actually and so I started doing the voices for a lot of the scripts and more than one and everybody in the office we became voiceover experts overnight because we had to do the scripts to present to Nickelodeon or HBO or whomever um, and so a producer then gave me um, voice work doing cartoons for um, Spider-Man I played Spider-Man's girlfriend and so that's how I started in narration I guess um, and then eventually I started working for colleges where I, they thought I had a good sound for uh, uh, text copy. I don't know if that's an insult or a compliment. I could read text bell, uh, books and make them sound interesting. So I started with colleges. And then from colleges eventually, after three years of that, I got into audiobooks with uh, actual publishers. Oh, great. So that's it. We, we did a lot of work, both Ren and I, for... Um what was the name of that press? Uh, um, David Ardotti. Oh, he was the middleman for. Uh, um, uh, well, it was University Pissari, Press. University no? Press. Well, it wasn't the University Press that exists now. He was uh, a wonderful middleman to different colleges, and uh, they would hire us um, very, very well. Give us a studio. And yeah, a director yeah. Director care. and spared no expense, and we did books for. Uh, a lot of university presses, like Yale Press and Harvard Press, and uh, yeah, that was a long time ago, but yeah. Joanna, let, let me ask you a question, um, as though I don't know the answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you seem to get, I, I know that your, your love is literary fiction. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you seem to get a lot of work in nonfiction. I know you and Sean work together as co-coaches in nonfiction frequently. What do you think makes you um, so popular in the nonfiction world? What do you bring to the party as far as you can uh, determine? You know, the only thing I can think of is, and I'm not sure if that's quite the case anymore because a lot more women are in... Uh, and, and speak a little louder if you will. A lot more women are in nonfiction right now. I think back in the day I was often considered the female voice of God. Anybody who does commercials knows that that often they would attribute it to male voices. They'd say they were looking for the male voice of God. Um, or maybe I just know that because I also did some casting for commercial voiceover for a while. So yeah, there'd be this big thing about looking for the perfect voice of God that was male, that would be able to be friendly, but tell you something and you'd believe it and understand it and it was coming from God himself. And I think there was a while when I started out, especially in university press, where people felt that from me, that I sounded intelligent, whatever that means. Um, and so, <laughs> um, which I got panned for once. I got panned on a, on a review 
<laughs> Somebody said it. She sounds too intelligent. <laughs> so apparently that was a downgrade for them. But um, maybe it's that. I, <laughs> I seem to have... The only thing I can think of is I do have an ability to read hard, hard nonfiction copy, not the nice nonfiction that's, you know, somebody's life or even something, you know, that, that's interesting to m masses, but uh, this kind of niche stuff that I can read it with authority, but I sound friendly. That's all I can think of, because there are a lot of people who can do nonfiction. They don't think they can. They think, oh, it's like this thing, but um, I don't know. I don't really know why, but I know that I've fallen into this, and that's where people see me. Well, I, I find it an interesting um, take on the nonfiction narration genre in general, because you need to be able to handle uh, certain concepts, certain words, certain phrases that can, if not delivered correctly, sound condescending, mm -hmm. uh, sound difficult, and you have to come across as an authority and, have, and be knowledgeable, but also friendly enough that people would take your class, listen to your TED Talk, pay attention to you. Yes, and I always hate when I say this, but I say it often, and especially for women, because um, women are judged more harshly for their voices than men are. A guy can have a voice that sounds like he's scratching the you know, chalkboard and people kind of live with it. But you know, if a, a woman is too deep or too high or sounds too feminine or not feminine enough or God knows what other criteria there is, um, they get ju we get judged more harshly. So it's, it's harder, I think, for us to even be successful in nonfiction because often, and it's not just men, other women will pick us apart. Um, yeah, you know, they, they, uh, they will listen to what you're saying if you're a man, but if you're a woman and you're doing an audiobook that's nonfiction, especially if it's a very intelligent topic, um, they start to veer off into, well, you know, she says that word funny or, or, uh, you know, some kind of nitpicking thing. And so I think it's, I think it's really tough for women, um, to do any voiceover other than it possibly in romance because uh, there's there's a different judgment basis for us than there is for a male voice so if somebody um, were new uh, female what do you recommend as the best path forward for them how how do they overcome these obstacles that you've overcome and make the most of it what where should they look where should they start is there anything they should avoid um hmm well if you're starting at all in, in narration, I always advise people that if you don't have an acting background to get some of an acting background, and that only means doing do some Zoom classes or if you or you know can do in person acting classes or try an improv class, something that kind of opens up your uh, imagination and takes your focus off of you, because that's part of the problem. We get so self-absorbed, even actors who are trained, we get so self-absorbed that it, we stifle ourselves. So I would suggest you don't have to be, you know, an actor, actor, but, you know, familiarize yourself with the concepts of acting, what a script is, what a beat is, uh, stuff like that, whether you're a man or a woman. But for women, I, I often tell them, um, especially for nonfiction, to try to get a style that works for you that's natural, but where the warmth, your natural warmth comes through. Uh, a, even with men, when they're narrating, especially in the beginning with nonfiction, you can hear when they narrate that they kind of either has, have an announcer style voice or um, this kind of, I am narrating now. Now I am telling you about the history of the pencil. Um, we don't use our own voices. And that's not what people want to hear when they hear an audiobook. They really just want to hear your voice. It's not about the best voice. It's about what you do with that voice. If you can tell a story, and nonfiction is a story just like fiction, um, do, you know, that's what you have to discover. And the best way to do that, for me, is to tell people to listen to samples of, of millions of people, to see what you like to see what you think works, to see what you think doesn't work, and make note of that. You know, you don't have to spend money. You can go to the uh, uh, libraries online and download tons of audiobooks and just listen to a few minutes to dozens of male voices, dozens of female voices, and see how the people, especially the people who work a lot, uh, what they bring to the party. Joy, let me touch on, because uh, uh, since you're on the process now, we have some excellent questions in our chat. Oh, okay. I don't know if you can read them, but... David asks, concerning process, do you break down the story, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, 
similar to a play, meaning what is the action, including the narrator, and use those discoveries to create the voice for each character. So I think David's asking in uh, your process or script prep, I think, in both genres. In, in fiction. And other, um, I think so. I do, I do break them. I don't call them books. I call them scripts. So I do mark them up as I would if I were doing a play um, <clears throat> or a scene. And I literally do that. I mark everything into scenes. And often for me, that can be one paragraph. Um, and each paragraph is a scene that when you put it all together leads to act one, act two, and act three, and the wrap up of, of the book. Um, for characters, to be honest, I don't, I don't often break them down that specifically. I mean, I have a, in my head, I'll say, oh, this guy's an ex-alcoholic, and so therefore he might behave this way, A, B, C, or D. Um, but I think, I don't know, I think it's more of a process for me as I try to picture who that person is. So uh, if I think that that particular person reminds me of my neighbor, who may not be an alcoholic, um, physically in my head, I will see that, I will see him, I will hear him. Now, I can't possibly emulate his every facet or even his voice. A woman emulating a man's voice is going to be not good so um but i have a person i have a person in mind for each of my characters so for me it's more a physical thing i physically put notes to who my character is do i have a background yeah for the main characters i might say you know i grew up uh grew up in a yeah i don't know in a in a rectory was a former priest blah 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 you know was tempted by his alcohol and blah 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 so yeah could he have grown up in a yurt <laughs> Could have grown up in a yurt, an igloo. Yeah. Um, so I do make notes. I don't know if this is helping answer the question, but I do make notes about a character. But it's more important to me, for me, the way I work, to have a visual in my head of that character. Don't, don't, don't stray traits. from the microphone, my love. Oh, his physical traits, his, the sound of his voice, uh, whether he speaks haltingly or quickly. Um, so his physical aspect to me is more in the forefront in my head. And it doesn't have to be a movie story. It could Sure, it could be Brad Pitt, but it doesn't have to be. It could be somebody I saw on the train once and I made a note that that would make an interesting character. So, so one of the things, so if for, I, I wanna go back to your uh, females. If somebody's starting off and they don't have, so that you're gonna have them take some, find a way to learn some more about acting, should they specialize? Uh, should they go after nonfiction if they're starting off? Do you? Uh, how, how do you advise somebody if I say, I well, don't know, should I? Which direction should I go to start with? <laughs> well, here's the thing. In my case, I started off with children's books and I started off with um, comics. I didn't start off with University Press. That came along later, so I don't know if it's possible. I think if you go in saying I only want to do nonfiction, or I only want to do literary, or I only want to do romance. You're cutting yourself off because you don't know what uh, publishers, producers, or authors see you as. Um, so you've got to keep yourself open. I think you just have to go in saying, um, I'm going to loosen up, whatever that means. I'm going to study some acting technique. I'm going to listen to other narrators. And then I'm going to pick my demos based on a whole array of things, you know, um, if it's if you think you can do romance, romance. If you think it might be nonfiction, maybe heavily on nonfiction, but throw in some fiction. Um, if you think you're great with dialogue, definitely focus on nonfiction. Uh, I don't think you can cut yourself off by saying, uh, you know, I'm going to do this and, I, and this is what I'm going to do. Because, you know, if you had asked me back in the day, I would have said, oh, literary, yeah, or, you know, nonfiction, definitely. I mean, fiction, definitely. I would never have seen myself for nonfiction. I mean, you're talking about somebody who did cartoon voices for a while. So it's kind of like, you know, I never, never saw myself in nonfiction. But people do. And producers and publishers always did. And colleges did. So they, they heard something I didn't hear. Okay. Because it's very hard to be subjective about yourself. Well, that's probably why people need to go to you as a coach and let you help them. But if, to summarize that, and I, please <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, I really should be going ahead if I'm new and doing as much as I can in different genres and letting the marketplace decide what the marketplace thinks that I'm good at. But in the beginning, I should do a, some nonfiction to the best of my ability. I should do a, 
cartoon, I should do a, a romance, I should do whatever, whatever I can do, do it, do it to the best of my ability. And then should I just ignore all the coaches and just do it on my own and, and, and decide that I like it all by myself? <laughs> no, I oh. think everybody, everybody, just like Johnny says, you know, I coach him, he coaches me. Um, every time I do an audition, I'm the poor guy. I drag him in and make him listen to six incarnations of, of one audition. Is it this one? Is it that one? How about that word? How about this word? Um, cause it's much easier for me to direct you than it is to direct myself, which is with all coaches. Um, nobody or very few people are really good at self-direction. It's an impossibility and we're not, we don't hear our own foibles. You know, if, if, I, you, if I'm coaching you and I say, you know, you, when, you, when you narrate, you break in the middle of a sentence. Not necessarily because there's a comma or a beat or a thought. You just you break in the middle of a sentence. And they're shocked. Really? Because you don't listen to yourself. But when you do, you're, you digress to the sound of your voice. I right. think most, most people just like, do I really sound like that? I didn't know I sound, or wow, I sound pretty damn good. You know, it's, it's, we get taken up in other spheres and we don't actually focus on the nitty gritty of, of the narration, of telling the story. And so we don't know maybe that we have a lisp or a syllabin S. Yeah. Uh, some, someone once said to me, uh, oh, I love the sound of your S's. And I went, do my S's have a sound? And apparently they do. So I started listening and I said, well, it sounds to me like my S's, I sound like I'm lisping. And they're like, no, 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 I love the sound of your S's. I'm like, okay, I, I don't hear that. Right. Um, so you do need a coach. You need a coach to tell you where your, where your problem areas are. Or uh, it's like if you do a book and you try to proof it yourself, right. it's an impossibility. You can't. If you think uh, cat is pronounced cot, and you hear yourself saying cot throughout the book, you're going, woo -hoo. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a little bit like cutting my own hair. I mean, yes. can I do it? I mean, I don't know. I, by the way, I, I don't try it, <laughs> thankfully. But anyway, I, I would be 100% bald instead of gray if I cut my own hair because that would work. But point being, <clears throat> the only way I can see about music, uh, some of the best athletes in the world, an Olympic diver, an Olympic diver cannot critique their own drive in real time. They have a coach that's watching. They get to watch the film after. And I do know that if you're a narrator, if you go back and listen to something you did six months ago, you have a chance of being a little bit objective about that if you wait enough time. But for most right. of us, in my case, that's throw uh, illness time where I'm, I want to throw up if I hear something that I did six months ago <laughs> because I've gotten better at it. But so you can self-evaluate, but self-evaluating in real time I, I, I'm like you. I won't say it's impossible, but it's nearly impossible to, yeah. to do it within a, a short period of time. So and yet, and yet, we're asked to do it regularly. Yes. As as audio actors, because self direction, and it's rare that you're going to work at Penguin Random House or McMillan or somebody and get that director, um, and even just an extra set of ears. So you've got to develop some skills in self direction. And I want to go back and talk to Joanna in a second about something Don brought up about um, try all the different things when you're starting out. I want to go back to that <clears> idea, <throat> but I don't want to lose touch with our, uh, our questioners in the, in the uh, audience here when Jim says a question about Joanna's coaching, and I thought it'd be a good time to bring, um, what do you think is the most valuable thing you bring to your coaching that other coaches don't emphasize as much? So tell us a bit about your, your coaching, I guess, Joanna, hmm. or general word. I I think what I bring is that I'm a very boots on the ground coach. Um, Explain I'm that. A good, yeah, I'm a good director. Um, I used to direct things for friends and, and I've done theater direct. Like I said, especially in college, I, you did everything. So when I left college, I tried everything, every aspect of theater. Um, <laughs> I, I did, no, no, like, when except, you direct, except for miming on the street. I remember you know. when Joanna directed my friend, uh, Larry Kelly, a wonderful guy, wrote a play. And, uh, and we got it into a, a play thing. And Joanna was our director. Larry insisted that she direct us. So, because we, we need direction, you gotta direct. So she takes on the role of director. So, <laughs> so the very first, he talks her into directing because she's just gonna stage it. She goes, I have direct. So she, gets, so she gets her thing marked up, ready to go. Because, okay, Larry, I want you to cross from stage right down to stage left. And he goes, why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but that's a, that's a, that's because men very often don't initially take good direction from females. And, Not and, true. And, correct. <laughs> and, this was just after he begged her to direct it. Right. Right. <laughs> and you know, the, I thought he hated me throughout, even though we're friends. And then he thought he was going to do another show, and he goes, "Oh, we might do this show next year. You want to direct?" <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, no, I didn't either. Uh, oh, the question. Oh, what do I bring? I said, yeah, uh, boots on the ground. By that I mean, um, I'm a good director. So I pick up on that. I pick up on a lot of things that I think other people don't, which probably can make me annoying. In other words, I don't get. I don't pick up on if you did one word that didn't sound right to me. I pick up on the whole picture at once because I look at it because I look at it as if it's a play. And so I direct you in real time towards a goal. In other words, I want you to give me you. I don't want you to give me acting. I don't want you to be somebody you're not. And so most of my uh, coaching is, and I know everybody said, well, we're all in real time, but it really is in real time. I, I, see, I can see almost immediately what your problems are. I can hear if I close my eyes what your problems are. I can pick apart immediately if you're doing a great job if there's one area where you just left the room i hear that you just left the room um so it's more that i i'm more tactical i deal with people's problems so i'm really good if you have a demo uh that you want done or uh, an audition piece and that's what i get called for a lot um i direct authors um who have no acting background and i can concisely give them enough of that and enough of what an audiobook should sound like and direct them in such a way that, that it works. Um, but I think most of it is that uh, I'm just a really good director. Can, and, you, uh, can you expand on, what do you mean, when I left the room? Oh. I don't even understand that term. <laughs> oh, um, we've all heard, you've seen it, you've heard it. You're watching a show and you're enthralled. And then all of a sudden you're not because the actor didn't literally but they did leave the room. They're now all of a sudden, well, what am I going to have for lunch today? You know, it's kind of, you're they, they in the moment. They checked out. Yeah, you know, they mentally just took a hall pass. And you don't, you know, you don't necessarily know that because they're physically there. But I know when someone took the, the hall pass, okay. even in a coaching session. You know, they're in, they're in, they're in, they're in. And then they're gone. Sometimes they're gone because they're approaching a piece they don't feel comfortable with in this. And... They'd, they rush through it or they'd rather, you know, only half give into it because, you know, if I do this fully, I, someone once said this, I, I, if I give this line fully, I'll cry. So cry, yeah. <laughs> cry. You can cry now. And when you're recording, you may cry and eventually you'll have to redo it and pull it back because we can't understand you narration wise when you cry, but people are afraid to give a hundred percent. And so I can pick out where you're 100% and where you're 60%. So would that be like in a conversation where rather than I'm listening to what you're saying, I'm already thinking about what I'm going to say to you. So I've checked out. And yes. you being one of yeah. those darn females, you pick up on that. <laughs> and you notice this guy, he ain't paying this any guy's attention. Going, He's got cookies. He's got cookies there somewhere. I <laughs> he's okay. That's what he's thinking about. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's a I don't know if that's a male female thing. If if everybody I don't know, I don't know, but I know you're I really know. really intuitive in terms of picking up the way people are responding about situations and life and narration, and when you watch people that maybe haven't succeeded, is there anything that stuck out to you as here's something that if they just understood they would do differently? Uh, can you think of anything that like? Oh, this is going to be a train wreck if they continue down this path. What things people might avoid? I can actually. Um, for me, there are uh, there are a lot of narrators who love the sound of their voice, and yeah, I don't have the best voice in the world, and I have a voice that you either love or hate, as far as I'm concerned. Either people love the way I sound, or they just go. Ah! Um, but some people just have beautiful voices. And I, I find a lot of that. Uh, <laughs> come on, um, a lot of a lot of narrators um, just are in love with their voices, and and you can hear it when they read because they're not telling a story. And what's happening? It's going to really get me condemned. What's happening is 
they don't know it because they get hired and they get hired because some listeners don't mind just listening to a nice male voice or a nice female voice and it doesn't bother them that it may be all one level or they're not really doing the author's work any justice or uh, even that I'm listening but I've checked out because I'm washing dishes and I've, I've missed the last five minutes because they, they, their voices lull you because they have nice sounding voices. And there are people that I hear who I know can do better. I've heard them do better, let's say at workshops and stuff like that. But they're, they, they let the sound of their voice do the narration as opposed to what's going on in their head and their heart do the narration. So, um, you know, Joe, yeah. you, you and I have discussed this a number of times. It, it strikes me, and I want your take on this for the general world here, that there is, while this business is, is booming, mm -hmm. just, just growing in size and numbers and everything, and there's work for everybody, et cetera, et cetera. I also think there is a lowering of the bar in terms of people get hired, the work that gets out, and I think... I think we that needs to be addressed through better coaching, uh, of more people working with better coaches. Um, I, I just think, I, I, I just think too many people say, "Geez, everybody said I had a nice voice, so I'm going to read a book to you," <laughs> as opposed to act, as opposed to tell a story. And yeah. I think there's too much of that happening, and I think it's a real danger. Everybody who's listening now or watching now or will watch later or talk to us is well aware that AI is nipping at our heels in one way or another. And it's my opinion, I'm interested in yours here, that one of the, one of the inroads, one of the ways AI can get into our business is by um, sh shitty acting, <laughs> you know, bad storytelling. Once you start hiring bad storytellers who have good voices and, and casting people do it for different reasons, and we can talk about that as well, but I think that opens a door. I think bad performances open a door to people being more accepting of AI, which is a bad performance by definition, because they're used to it. If the audience says, yeah, it's good enough, as soon as it's good enough, that can spell the death for a lot of talented actors. Your thoughts, Ms. Pillar? <laughs> I agree. Um, I, to be, I, you know, I, I am one of those people who I do listen, I don't necessarily go to Audible, but I, I go to a library app and I'll, I'll listen to, you know, pieces from various people, new people, people have been around for years. <clears throat> and I, I think it's a culmination of a lot of stuff. This business became a multi-billion dollar business. It seemed, well, it seemed like overnight, of course, it was over the course of many years. Um, so many people have jumped on. So many books are going into audio. So many casting people are inundated. Um, uh, authors now want to decide who narrates their book. Um, there's so much going on. Uh, you know, a lot of COVID closed down a lot of the production areas of a lot of publishers. So they do, they farm out production all over the place. And so a lot of publishers no longer seem to have a consistent style if that makes sense. So, you know, years ago, you could hear a book almost and go, that was done through Penguin Random House. That was done through recorded books. You knew the style. Um, you don't anymore because they, they farm it out to whomever's available half the time. Uh, you don't know if it's someone who's really proficient in, in uh, producing or not. You just don't know. Um, the thing with uh, uh, casting people is... Uh, years ago, a lot of them were former actors who went into uh, uh, audiobooks and they did the casting. So they had a background. They knew what they wanted to listen to. Now, I don't know where a lot of the casting people come from. Um, they may come from technical ends. I don't know if they have a, a, a background in acting. So I don't know if they respect the need for actors more than just a pretty voice. I don't know. I can't say they do or they don't. And then, you know, you have authors who um, they have in their head a voice for their book, uh, especially if it's like memoir, let's say. They have in their head, you know, that uh, so-and-so is the voice of their book. And I don't know if they necessarily pick the person who's the best person for the, for the job, but they pick the voice they like. So things have changed a lot. And um, I think also among the listeners, things have changed because there's so many books 
of various quality. There's great quality, there's middle quality, there's poor quality, and they listen to all of them. And in fact, it seemed to me that years ago, um, a lot of listeners uh, who we hated, the ones who would come on and say, well, I think this person is really awful, you know, in their little dark room. Um, more of those people were around than there are now. And I think it's because people are willing to accept less, maybe, instead of more. They're willing to accept just being read to, I guess, is what I'm saying. And so you hear a lot of narration that is just people reading as opposed to people putting acting into the book. And I think that... Uh, will influence AI. In fact, there are people who I know are great narrators who recently, I've listened to a couple of their, their books and I, one person I literally took my headset thing off and went, is that really so-and-so or is that AI? And because the way it was mastered and the way they were inflecting, it was so like this that it sounded like an AI version of this person I know is a fantastic narrator. And, and yet, I noticed it, but when I looked at people who said something, they, they either didn't like the sound of the, you know, the book, the storyline, if it was a negative, and always there are people who don't like you personally for whatever reason. But on the main, the book was carrying good stories. So I, st I thought, you know, maybe it's me. Maybe, maybe my coaching style is going out the window. Maybe we're on a different road. I don't know. I'm pretty sure that good coaching, like good acting, never Never, never ends, never stops, never has a, uh, a, 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 a end by date. I think if people want to take shortcuts, and they do, and some people, look, some people, let's not be dishonest, some people are naturally just good at stuff. You know, some people are better swimmers than others. Some people are better actors than others. Some are, you know, there are just people who are just damn good. God bless them. But for a lot of people, they aren't. And those are the people that I'm concerned with. Not that they're not, I don't mind them coming and working, but I want them to be better. I want them yeah. to up their game over and over and over. Now, here's something from Thomas. If someone doesn't have access, that we can talk about this, to a trained ear or a coach, which everyone does, by the way, or doesn't have the funds or just starting out, what would you recommend they do for their recordings? Do they proof or hear them? Do they proof hear themselves? So if I understand that correctly, uh, if someone doesn't have loot to hire a coach, what do they do? I have an answer, but let's hear yours. Oh, well, again, I would suggest listening to other narrators. You know, listen, listen to everything. Um, also, there are enough uh, Zoom things, I think, that where people, you can get tidbits of people. If you can't afford a coach, um, there are plenty of coaches who will give you 15 minutes just to talk to them. I mean, yeah. Johnny will, I will. You know, you can say, this. these are my problems. This is, I can't afford you. I can't afford this. I can't afford. We've been known to pay it forward, you know, if we, yeah. if we can. Yeah. If we've already paid the rent, um, we, can, we you know. Um, but I would just suggest listening to other narrators. And, uh, again, if you don't know anything about acting, maybe read, read some books. There are books out there on the art of acting. So you're familiar with concepts. There are exercises in those books uh, that you can do by yourself at home with nobody watching, uh, which can help open up your imagination. Um, this, this is a good chance for our commercial, too. Just so you know, um, we'll tell you, we'll mention this a couple of times, but uh, Joanne and I have a special deal. You can coach with both of us an hour each. Um, you just go to johnnyheller.com, click on workshops, and you'll see it. You can get Joanna for an hour and me for an hour. It's three hundred dollars total, which is a discount for us. And you can you have to pay by the end of twenty twenty three, but you don't have to use it twenty twenty three. You can wait till twenty twenty four. We can work with you on whatever you want. You get an hour of each of us. So that's something if you're interested in. We're we're putting out there. It's just a little little discount for the end of the year. And my my take to Thomas's question is: Look, I understand that funds can be tight. I also understand that one needs to stop thinking about voiceover in any genre as, as a side hustle. It's a business. It's a choice. If you want to get into audiobook narration, then you must be prepared in auditions to compete with Joanna, to compete with Johnny, to compete with Scott, with Sean, with uh, Joel. With, you know, and they're, they're all out there auditioning. Don asks almost every workshop we have, every session we have, do I still audition? Well, yes, of course. 
Always. I'm always looking for the next gig. Same as everybody else. So you need to find a way when you get into this business to accept it as not just an art form, but a business. And that's going to take some investment, <clears throat> some capital investment. Invest in yourself. Invest in your, your studio equipment. Invest in a coach. Invest in some acting lessons. Does it cost money? Sure. Will it make you a better actor and a better storyteller? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if that's what your end goal is, make plans for it. If you don't have them, if you're not good enough right now and you feel you're not good enough right now, then you're not good enough right now. So do what you need to do <laughs> to get good. Because yeah. you're going to compete with people who are better right now. The, and you're not going to get the gig. The other thing I was going to touch on is just that, that um, frequently... I'll get a new student who their concern is, do I buy studio bricks? Do I buy a thousand dollar microphone? Right. Do I buy, you know, this ridiculous obsession with the equipment, you know right. what I mean? Um, and I'm like, well, let's get you onto the road so you understand yourself and where you're going as a narrator. And don't worry about a, you know, $1,200 microphone, not that I think you yeah. necessarily need it, or a studio brick, and I, bricks, I don't think you necessarily need it. Um, but people seem to be more interested in the uh, technological advances, what they can get. And should I use this program? And should I use a declicker? And should, They're worried about as, how to take breaths up before they learn how to breathe. Yeah, it's like, yeah. how do I take a breath? Well, how about learning to breathe through the copy first? Um, so, yeah, I think there's a crazy obsession with the, the software and, and all the accoutrement that goes with your studio as, ooh, as opposed to start at square one right. if you if you wanted to be a film actor and all you're worried about is are they going to have my spot and are they going to give me a good mic what, um, what's, at the, <laughs> uh, yeah, what's at the craft table yeah what's at the craft table um and by the way i'm a vegetarian so yeah no um i think there is too much emphasis on on all the stuff and yeah. not so if you're going to spend what's a studio brick ten thousand dollars i mean if you're going to spend ten thousand dollars on that and and a thousand dollars on this Spend a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks or whatever it is, and give yourself even just one or two coaching sessions to put you on the right path. And, and for future sponsors, we are not putting down studio bricks. Yeah, we're not. <laughs> no, so but here's it's the kind thing: of, I, you're putting the horse before the cart, as the yes. saying goes. Yeah, and no. I, I get it all the time where somebody's telling me, "Oh, I can't afford, I can't afford your video program," which I mean, I have payments of thirty-seven bucks a month. Somebody can get something, you know, that will solve their tech problems for 37 bucks a month for seven months or something like that. But anyway, a small amount of money, uh, a minor investment. And then I see them in one of the groups say, I just bought a thousand dollar mic. Or <laughs> I, I, and I think, wait a minute. I remember two weeks ago you were saying I don't have any funds to do mm -hmm. this and I'm investing. I'd rather have somebody with a hundred and fifty dollar mic and working on the room and they put up blankets and pillows and they've done what they can do and they're working on their performance part of it uh, then go ahead and spending a thousand dollars on a mic or a thousand dollars on an interface the amount of money people spend on some of this peripheral stuff and then they come back and say but i don't now i don't have any money for coaching they're doing it in the wrong order and if they would just and there is a, and then i want to go back to your thing about listening to narrators Listening to narrators is awesome, but make sure you're listening to Joanna, listening to books that Johnny's done, listening, in other words, be very selective into who you're listening to because on a royalty share basis, Don Barnes can get audiobooks, and I have. And if you're dumb enough and want to waste some time, go back and listen to something that I read, go on Audible. I don't want to, I've, uh, you want something that I'm unproud of from a performance point of view, but proud of that I did it. You'll find a whole series of really bad books about 10 years ago that I did when I first started out because I wanted to understand the perspective. <clears throat> and point being, anybody can get uh, 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 royalty share books and they'll show up on Audible. Therefore, if you're, don't do this. Do not do this. <laughs> Don't waste your time listening to something that I did 10 years ago other than maybe the sample and then, then throw up and then move on. But find the people that are successful, that, are, that you have publishers willing to pay a good, solid hourly rate. And what you'll understand is those people are the ones you want to emulate as opposed to listening to my old stuff. 
Big, big deal that I got some royalty. I bet I could get some. I got to do this. I need, I'll get a royalty share book for my dog. Um, but yeah. that doesn't mean that's somebody that you should listen to. So you do want to be selective. And I will say when I was a young musician, the, one of the hugest advantages that I had, I was listening 10 hours a day to other great world-class musicians so that I had a concept in my head of what is some of the best stuff out there. So listen to Heller, listen to Perrin, listen to, there's a bunch of other people. And if you don't know who to listen to, use your 15 minutes talking to them to say, what are your, the books that you've done that you think represent some of the, your best work? and get some recommendations from them so you're getting good input from people that have both succeeded and know the business insanely well. So, Johnny, if we I should put add... together a, a, a <clears throat> list of your favorite stuff, and Joanna, we should do that with you too. But that's what All you right. guys should talk to these coaches about. Go ahead, Johnny. We, I should also add that if you listen to a Don Barnes or a Scott Brick or a Jen, whatever, and you decide, gosh, I don't like or I do like, mm -hmm. Try to write down, make literally write down what you like and don't like. Um, something deeper than I don't like the sound of the voice. What is yeah. going on or not going on? Because that's instructive. I've listened to a lot of my students who have books out. I've listened to a lot of my peers who have books out. And I listen to them and I think, you know, I, I appreciate that they're successful, but I don't like their performance style. And there are some big name narrators who I don't like. Why? Now, I, I'm not going to share names because it's unfair, but I know why I don't like what they do. And it could be the choices they made in that specific storytelling moment, or it could be a consistent issue that I see that somehow doesn't seem to bother the audiobook buying public. I think it's important to, to define what you like and don't like. And if there's something that Joanna does, because, oh my God, I love that she's able to yada yada, then you should be able to write that down and you should attempt to head that way as well. If that's what Joanna does well and that appeals to you, then find how to make it so for you as well. Joanna and I, when we, we just did the New England Narrator Retreat we hosted. And I think there are at least four or five scholarship students there. People didn't have money to attend and we got them in. There is in this industry, in this world, someone said, we all love what we do. We do. All of us, all of us, all three of us and many, many, many more, too many, too, too numerous, have helped people who don't have the funds right away move forward in their career one way or another. And, and uh, that's, that's who we are. And that's who the industry is. Yeah. And I, I, there's something wonderful about that. Um, that's what I'm going to say about that. But just understand, we're there to help, but we're not, we can't give everything away. <laughs> there's a, you, you gotta, you've got to, you've got to pay your, your, you got to pay for the experience and the understanding, but we're not, um, we're not, we're not, uh, 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 not Nazis about the thing. You know, we can work something out. <laughs> yeah. And most of it, you see, also, here's yeah. the weird thing. If you're a coach and been doing this a long time, I don't mind helping people for free who are doing their part. If they're, if they're really, really working it because people, I'm like everybody else. I would never be where I'm at today without some great mentors, some great people. There are so many people over the course of my 60 years that have helped me through a situation that I probably wouldn't have been able to get out of on my own. And it's happened so many times. It's a joy to pay it forward. But there is something negative about if somebody isn't doing their part and working it as hard as they can, it gets to be, it's a drain on you, but you flip it around. If I've met somebody and they're doing their part, I've given away my programs for free. I don't like to, I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing that very often, but it has to be a situation. A gentleman had been in the service, a gal had been in the service, come back and they're working and they're working and because they're working. So if you don't have any funds, go find people and develop relationships over time and you do your part and then others will do their part too. And that's why the whole circle keeps going. But I would I, say the a APA has a mentorship program. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. audio pub, they, well, they have mentors. What about this um, SAG? Uh, SAG gosh, has, they have, they the have. SAG after foundation. Foundation, yeah. yeah. If you're in yep. classes, workshops, all classes, kinds of Classes, workshops on uh, a technique. I mean, Johnny used to teach one on technique at the local by us. So, yeah. so um, Joanna, somebody had a question here. So obviously all three of you love what you do. Are there aspects of your work that you don't like and what do you do to get past them? I mean, don't, mm -hmm. and uh, excluding not liking Johnny. 
Okay, you can pass him on your own. <laughs> Are there aspects I don't like? Um, <clears throat> yes, because I do a lot of nonfiction, I don't like. I used to find joy in research, and now I. Uh, <laughs> no, once you start doing thirty-five and forty-hour books with a lot of research, you're so off research. Um, I find researching is gets on my nerves now. Whereas before, I used to think, oh, that's interesting. Oh, and. I'd find six tangents attached to that that I didn't know. And then, oh, is that what that means? And blah, 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 blah. Wait a but, second. Um, wait, wait, wait. I have to stop you. What do you mean by researching? Why, why in the world would someone research a book? What are you talking about? I, I know well, not of this research thing. What do you, what do you mean? <laughs> in nonfiction, uh, there's a, there can be science. There can be uh, different psychological terms you've never heard of. There can be all kinds of words that you have no clue what they mean. And they're very long and some of them seem like they're all consonants. And so um, you have to research, you know, the pronunciation, what the word means. So you, you have to sound, when you read that book, you ha it has to roll off your tongue like this is second nature to you. You know exactly what this means and, you, and this is the love of your life, you know, okay. if it's psychology or science or quantum leaping or whatever. And so there's a lot of research that goes into that. Um, I had to do a book on Israel that, oh my God, I think the book was 37 hours, I think. And I started to tally up my research hours and I couldn't. Because when I realized how, how much I was doing, I was losing my mind. It was six times the narration time of the book. It was just constant research. And so, yes, there's also knowing when to hire somebody else to do that for you. And that was a book I should have. Like we're saying, use your money wisely. I should have used my money wisely in that particular instance. Um, but I like being hands-on, and I initially really liked research, so I frequently still do it myself. But okay. if it's a real pinch, I have no problem asking somebody else to help. Okay, so what I want, uh, but what I want to go back <clears throat> to is this. Here's the takeaway for me on that, and please correct me if I'm wrong. If you take out a nonfiction book, you don't just start reading at the beginning cold. You actually are doing a bunch of prep work. And so the big takeaway for somebody, you know, I suspect everybody picked up on this. If you take a nonfiction book, you are probably going to need to also make sure that you do some background study of that topic so that you can have some gravitas when you are saying something because you actually understand, as opposed to me just reading a sentence that says, mm -hmm. hey, the, the moon is made of cheese. <laughs> I actually should have some idea that the moon might not be made of cheese and what it is made of so that I can then talk through the, uh, narrate the book appropriately based on some background knowledge. Is that close? Yes, yeah. I, actually, when I get a book, one of the first things I do is um, obviously look up the author and see if I can find a video or any anything about them because since I look at everything as a script as far as I'm concerned even if it's nonfiction I'm a one-man show and this is the person I'm representing and so I try to hear them I try to hear the sound of their voice I try to hear what their take is when they're questioned on certain subjects if they're talking about that specific book fantastic and then if it's also and I don't spend you know days and days but I do a I do a search, and I also search um, the topic. I mean, if it's on quantum physics, and I don't understand quantum physics, I look for the dummy version. I go online. There are plenty of people who are willing to tell you uh, from the, your, on their little you know, videos at home uh, a lot about science or psychology or history or anything else. And so I do research the topic so I know what I'm talking about. If I get one of those unpronounceable words, um, yeah. I want to know what it is. I don't want to know just how to pronounce it. Right. I want to know what it represents in the scheme of the book. So, yeah, I do. I research a lot of the background, uh, just as I would as if this were, if I was playing a scientist on stage. Um, I'd have to, everything that I say, I have to commit to 100%. So I do that. I do that kind of a background check on all the books I do. Cool. Well, and I'll bet you uh, when you do nonfiction uh, or when you do fiction, you end up researching what you're going to, the, the characters you're doing, you, or mm -hmm. you have a concept in your head from your, your experience. Yeah. So one of those two is going to kick in. If you didn't know what a scientist was like, you uh, maybe uh, they, they, they cast one of the persons is a mortician. And uh, maybe you haven't worked in a morgue before, I'm just guessing. And so you <laughs> might go ahead and do some research on what that is even about because maybe, yeah. the, right? Is that close? Yeah. Okay. So you do it as an actor for a specific character. Yeah. You do the same. Uh, go ahead. 
I gotta wonder what makes someone want to be a mortician. All of us try to steer very far away from death. Necrophilia, so, mostly. Yeah. So I don't. I'd like to know that mindset. I like what makes a person want to do that. Usually, their parents did it. That's I have a guy yes. in high school that he took over his dad's business. But uh, and aside, anyway, yeah. Well, for instance, what made them a mortician as opposed to a serial killer? I, I, <laughs> I well, if you can combine those two, you've got a really nice business plan oh, right yeah. there. Yeah, Ooh, yeah. yeah. And get a funeral home as well. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, there's a there's a whole business scan right there. Oh God. <laughs> so somebody's saying if they did leverage the three hundred dollar deal, uh, how what what's the best leverage they can do since they have both of you? I mean, do they go I, to, I, do the, I don't think I understand the question. I don't uh, understand. I guess they. I think what they're saying is how to use both. In other words, are they better off, let's say, using nonfiction or romance or whatever, science fiction with you, and maybe nonfiction with me, since I've done a lot of nonfiction? I think that's what they mean, the person means. Um, I, I suppose the best way to leverage the deal is. It'd be the same as if they just hired both of you individually. How would I leverage yeah, they, that yeah. time with you two if I was just saying, I what deal or no deal, I hire you two to help. Uh, yeah. What's the best way to make the most of you two? Well, you get an hour with Joanna separately and an hour with me separately. So we are different. We're similar in our tactical style, but we're different people with different uh, resumes behind us in different books. And I think you can take a look at the kind of books Joanna uh, excels at and the kind that I seem to excel at and wherever let's say you're working on an audition or a demo piece that's up my road up my alley if you will and, and one that's up so work with Joanna the ones that seem closer to her stuff me closer to my stuff also we may say here's an interesting thing you work with different coaches let's say you work with Don Johnny and Joanna and all three of us note the same thing I think there's something to take home there if all three of us say something completely different, I think it's a little confusing. I promise that almost never happens. If Joanna notes a consistency on your part of losing connection or something, and I note it, and Don notes it, I think you have a problem with losing connection. Mm -hmm. So you, that's how you leverage the thing. See what the coaches agree on. Let's say you read the same piece for Joanna that you read for Don and for me. We all have similar takes. Well, I think you take a look at the similarity. The same with the um, Audible reviews, they're not worth anything unless they all say, you're too fast. He's too fast. I can't understand him. Well, that's if a bunch of people say that. I think you've got to realize that maybe you're too fast. Now, if the same people say you're too fast or listening at three and a half times, they sped it up. Uh. Well, then they're idiots. You can't, you can't take that home at all. But I do think you need to, uh, you need to just look at what Joanna's done and say, what do I, if you have an hour with Joanna and you will, what do I want to talk about? What's the best way? And I think you know the answer to that. Joanna, any comments? No, um, I, I agree with John. And the other thing is, I think, and I don't think this is a bad thing to say, but be, because we're sort of working together on this, um, depending on who you see first, I'm, I'll make notes, Johnny will make notes. We, we will probably discuss it with each other and say, well, this is what I thought this person's high points were. And this is what I thought the person's low points on. So by the time you get to the second one of us, we've already heard, okay, this is what, you know, Johnny thinks this person excels at. This is where he thinks the problems are. And so I am now specifically even looking for those problems aside from everything else I'm looking for. So between the two of us, hopefully we'll either uh, make whatever that good stuff is better and whatever the bad stuff is disappear or yep. at least get toned down. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to throw in there essentially what what they are both saying is research. If you you if you research them, if you and you I would do this with any coach I go to. I, if you know a little bit about their background, you're going to know their strengths and weaknesses. And all coaches have usually the great coaches have a whole bunch of strengths and a few minor weaknesses if they've been doing this a while, because they've been able to refine out the weaknesses from experience. And that's why you're going to them. Yeah. OK. But you also, if you were getting their deal, if you're smart, one of the things you absolutely should do is go listen to Joanna, go check out what she's done, what's her strengths, what she likes, and you go in with a mindset of, I'm going to find out the things she's strong as that, and I'm going to take advantage of that, and then go to Johnny and say, oh, what is he strong yeah. as that, and I'm going to take advantage of that. And both of them, 
they are not going to sugarcoat if Don's skipping syllables every three words. <laughs> they are going to point out nicely, appropriately, hey, 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 you need to work on your enunciation. You need to work on your diction. Or, no, no, no. What, you're doing that stuff close enough. It's the acting in terms of, I haven't done any research on the characters. I'm trying to read cold. Oh, that's not a th good thing to do. And they would advise you how to make the most of the time that they're with them. They want to see you succeed. This is the weirdest thing people don't understand about a coach. These guys don't just want your money. What they want to hear is six months later, wow, that session you helped me with gave me the one piece of information that allowed me to get that and win that audition. Yep, we love that. Yeah, yeah. it's a joy. You know, it's, it's one of those things that they're working for because, yeah, we all want to make money, but it's also the how do people do after they interact with us that's a huge huge deal i would also say i think if you're really into characters and characterization johnny's brilliant at that very very he's brilliant at characters and dialogue so if you've got a piece that's heavy in that definitely bring that to his table um i've done every kind of nonfiction known to mankind I've got nonfictions out there that my name's not attached to, like I said, at universities, at museums, and stuff like that. So if you're into history or biology or uh, memoir, I've done a number of memoirs, you know, bring something maybe appropriate to that to me, if that helps you. But, uh, yeah, I mean, yep. I think you're getting two for one because we're going to work together with you. Yeah, Even though yeah. you're working with us separately, we will powwow. And so you're kind of working with us at the same time, if that makes sense. Yeah. And what one last commercial, because I know we're running out of time. Um, Sunday, December 10th, Paul Allen Rubin, who will be a guest with Don and I coming up soon, uh, have a uh, one day workshop, Sunday, December 10th, in New York City, um, an audiobook acting intensive. I think it's safe to say that Joanna will also show up and probably Paula I'll Parker show up. and maybe have a few words with you. But um, it's very limited, it's a small space, which we, we're doing on purpose. Um, I think we did it in August with about, oh, 15 people, I think. So we're going to keep it small like that if we can. Um, you know, you get lunch and everything, but you get, Paul and I work differently, but well together. Mm -hmm. And we both want, uh, as does Joanna and Paula, we both want to talk acting and get back to the basics of acting to make you a better storyteller, more engaging. That's our plan. Yeah. And I, I just think that, that this is one of Joanna's strengths that people underestimate. She's not putting on a resume, oh, I've sat in on 400 workshops with, <laughs> with all these different narrators who come from different points of view combined with working with somebody like Johnny all the time. You end up, Johnny is associated with some of the best people in the business. So she gets to see, be a fly on the wall and participate among, with people who are at the top of their game, who are booking work with the publishers, and therefore she has a point of view. She's seen people succeed, she's seen people fail, she's seen people go leave the business after a year at a level that few of us will ever get to see. So spend some time with these two. You get a perspective that is very, very, very hard to find out there in the marketplace. So um, if we missed a question, Remember, Johnny and I are doing this every week, and Joanna, you're always a joy to work with. You have a better Aww. attitude about putting up with the two of us than <laughs> almost anybody. So we're, you know, thank you for doing that. But uh, for for the people that are out there, sometimes we can't get to a question, so please bring it back to us next week. And sometimes we may have to go back and ask Joanna something, but seek them out individually. Find the stuff that they've done in the background. And then, of course, every week we're doing this. Johnny and I are committed to doing this every single Tuesday at the same time on YouTube. So please, uh, when it's done, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Throw in comments and share this with other people if you liked it. So we really appreciate you being here. Joanna, any last words? We really appreciate you being here. No, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. It was, it was a little daunting. You know, I've, I've been with you before Don, but the two of you, I thought, how is this going to work? I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it was fun. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for being here. And Johnny, as always, any last words? Um, no, I, I did the commercials that I wanted. I appreciate everybody being there. Um, Joanna and I and Don are all easy to get hold of via email or social media. We're, we're here to, well, you know, we're, we're interested in you and your career. We truly are. Yeah. Um, so reach out to us if you have more to say. Thanks for viewing this. 
Don and I really want this to take off and be um, uh, a real good thing for our community on a regular basis. So do share with people. Um, and you have some great people coming up in the next. Oh weeks. yeah, we got uh, uh, Julie Wilson. We have uh, uh, Eric Black. We back from Dreamscape. We have Carol Monda, Scott Brick, uh, Steve Warner. War I'm 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 reading yeah. here. Scott Brick, Steve Warner, Julie Wilson, Carol Monda, Tom Deere, Anna Clements. It's crazy the people who have. Yeah. Matter of fact, so just so for people in the audience know this, we've had this unbelievable experience where when we've asked people, will they show up? Everybody just says yes. So, and part of that, a lot of it, is that Mr. Heller here has paid his dues and paid it forward so many times over the last 10 years that people are just saying, sure. And we're getting some of the I mean, people, I'm just going, darn. So it's because of what he's done in the past, okay? Whether you know, I appreciate the 10 year coming, but I've been at it since 1990. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't want I to pretend you're as old as you are, Johnny. Old. That's right. <laughs> 10 years good lord <laughs> okay mr heller has been around since the dirt age that's right that since since before dirt okay. in my day we stood on street corners and yelled out the chapters of books to passers-by yeah and so that perspective and those relationships are paying off for you today who are listening and we look forward to seeing you next week you have a fantastic day we'll see you on the wires bye-bye Bye everybody thanks joanna thank you thank you